one of the um, one of the older missions working on the pyramid fields. Um, you know, a couple of slides already. I use them just to illustrate that it's uh, the topography that you see nowadays is not the topography the ancient Egyptians experienced firsthand. So uh, this is just uh, bring you back to my talk yesterday. It's only important to realize that uh, the, the key issue, the, the principal major entrance to the pyramid fields of Abu Sir and Saqqara that formed a single site with a common history during the third and second millennium BC was provided by the lake of Abu Sir, which as I gather from Joe Wagner's um, presentation was probably operating on similar principle like uh, the one either artificial or semi-natural semi in in the Bidos explored recently by uh, UPenn uh, mission. Uh, pyramid field um, from the air, um, most of you probably identify individual individual complexes uh, from the right, which is from the north. Sahura, the founder of the necropolis, then it's uh, Neferikara, uh, by appearance the largest pyramid in the necropolis, and then brothers Ra Neferev, who passed away very early, and then New Sera, which who represents probably one of the uh, breaking points in the history of the third millennium BC, and all around you have uh, minor um, minor archaeological objects. Um, today I will focus um, on South Abusir, which is located over here, very close to the Lake of Abusir, North Saqqara, over here. Um, first of all, remote sensing, because when you come to such a place. Um, you tend to be desperate because there is nothing, just hillocks of sand and rubble. Nevertheless, each hillock, as archaeologists can imagine, represent, um, represents um, a major, major archaeological entity in the field, be it mostly mastabas, individual tombs, shafts, etc. Um, thus, the, the mapping history of Abu Sir, Saqqara, and pyramid fields in general has a long history starting with Napoleon, um, which is the map on the left, then through Wise and Peering, um, with probably the most important mapping feat of the 19th century as far as pyramid fields are concerned, the map of Lepsius that is um, reproduced with some detail in Lepsius Denkmäler. A um, couple of years back, we got interested in the original plan provided by Lepsius. And, uh, it was possible to find it in the, on the premises of the Berlin Academy of Sciences. It's a three, meter, three meters long thing covering the fields of um, Dakshur, starting on the south, Saqqara, and Abu Sir. And what is quite um, interesting to see is that the details provided by the map um, are slightly different from those you can get from Lepsius official publication, uh, publication I mean his Denkmäler. The map needly, at, at least at that time, at that point, uh, need, badly needed um, restoration. Uh, the only thing we could do at the moment was to uh, spread it on this huge table. It took us a couple of, um, well, it took us some time uh, to find such a table. Yeah, the academy and our photographer um, working on the on the facsimile of the map. So this is a focus. Uh, this is a part of it. Detail. Um, focusing, focusing on the pyramid fields of Abu Sir over here, with Abu Ghraib in the upper right corner, Lake of Abu Sir still mapped by Lepsius, and we know from the locals that it was still in operation back in the 50s of the last century, um, and it was a semi semi permanent body uh, body of water. Later on, it was Jacques de Morgan who uh, mapped the same area, which is Dakshur on the left. Saqqara and pyramid fields of Abu Sir. Um, and um, in the GIS environment, you can compare all the maps in different layers because each map um, renders different geomorphology, different sets of archaeological entities that come up, disappear as time goes. You know that, for instance, famous tomb of Mechen is lost and Pekernefer tombs and some others. And this is a, a basically similar scene that I was also showing yesterday, um, provided by the QuickBird satellite um, operated by Digital Globe Company. Um, 
with a precision of 60, 54 centimeters per pixel, uh, which is maybe um, um, too detailed because the smallest archaeological entity, entity you can you can discern in the in the field is perhaps a shaft one by one meter. So in fact, when you close when you have a close up of a specific uh, part on the map, you can even um, discern discern individual puppies, but not everybody is a uh, sinologist. Um, here um, is um, one of the applications in GLA's environment. A close-up of South Abu Sir Mastabas is the central mound with several ancient access routes that come from the lake of Abu Sir and link the lake, the western shore of the lake, with principal Mastabas. Um, some of them are still unexcavated at this point. And geophysical survey that adds valuable information as far as the subsurface features um, are concerned. In this particular case, it's a georadar, ground penetrating radar. And 3D modeling from 2D, uh, two dimensional satellite image. So, here again, somewhere um, out of the screen here is the lake of Abu Sir. You can see natural wadi coming f descending from the western plateau of the desert partially contributing to the na to the water discharge in the lake and some artificial access routes leading to individual mastabas on the central mound in south um, south abu sir so this is another application a three dimensional i i wouldn't say a model but it's re 3d reality uh, converted uh, from the uh, from the two-dimensional contour plan in combination with satellite image. So this is the pyramid field and the whole pyramid side. Now now we work also on on the inclusion of Saqqara that we finished in 3D a couple of weeks ago. So I will basically talk about the last two seasons or a couple of uh, seasons in this particular area of the pyramid field of Abu Sir. Um, I will focus on the 5th and 6th dynasties um, that have quite a specific history. Um, one of them um, starts at the beginning of the 5th dynasty, which is a, a start of a new era in terms of history, administration, political situation. Maybe you know that, maybe not, but this is exactly the period when non-royal officials start to penetrate even the highest positions in the admi administration of the country. And they start to marry, for some reasons, also royal daughters. So Ptakshep says from the British Museum is one of them who was uh, allowed to marry such a, such a woman belonging to the royal family. Um, and it, this, is, this has a lot to do with, uh, with legitimation, social status, and political history. Um, the, the, the transition between the fourth and fifth dynasties uh, was commented here also yesterday. So very briefly to remind you, it's, um, there is every reason to believe that uh, Shepseskaf and Uzerkaf were related and they used several means uh, to prove their legitimacy connection and also they were harking back to the early 4th dynasty and to the history of Snofru. One example is for all, Snofru who uh, calls himself to be Lord of Maat. Uzerka, for instance, is the one who is performing Maat, Neb Maat, Iri Maat. I have showing this um, this line as well, so uh, we can move on here. Um, um, and uh, the 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 major discoveries in Abu Sir from 2012 and 13 are necessarily linked with the era of new Sera and post new Sera period. Um, there has been some discussion already on this rural. I, I believe that this is one of several old kingdom or third millennium uh, rulers that are to be linked or characteristic for so-called punctuated approach to the history. Um, he built a quite amazing structure um, in Abu Ghraib, Sun Temple. Uh, he marks a, a true origin of an entirely new historical uh, period um, that can be seen in many, uh, in many uh, different fields of the, of the society of the day. For instance, in statuary, here you have the famous Munich uh, twin statue. Um, in the time of New Sera, the, the highest positions in the state are taken by um, very influential people like Tashep says, for instance, um, who started his career as a hairdresser. So um, officially no legal functions, but still quite influential 
and well informed as the hairdressers tend to be always um, throughout the human history. Um, it's basically the, the first one together with uh, T who, um, who uh, usurp uh, many uh, formerly exclusive royal regalia like um, East West oriented uh, cult chapel, open court with pillars, not with columns but with pillars. Um, uh, magazines, etc. So this is the period when uh, when powerful families start to reserve more and more royal uh, rights and uh, um, start to develop um, semi semi independent uh, policy in the state. Later on, we, two or three generations later, we can observe the same in the provinces, like for instance, the Bidos and Unis family, etc. A uh, so-called new attitude also starts during the time of New Sera, although there are some, there is some discussion as for the Fourth Dynasty. Um, actually, it's very difficult to uh, imagine a Fourth Dynasty king being kneeling. So, from the from New Sera's um, Sun Temple, we have the first attestation of a well-attested attestation of, of a king uh, kneeling in front of the gods. And the Sixth Dynasty, very famous statue of another king. Um, so New Sera, uh, South Abusir excavations, we, over the last few seasons we came across a huge uh, family cemetery that, uh, that was started by, um, by, the, uh, by Mastaba of Shepseskafang, probably it's still um, work um, that hasn't been finished yet, but uh, I will give you at least a hypothetical explanation for today. Um, I will talk about AS37, uh, which is the so-called solar mastaba, mastaba of Nefer Inpu and Veser Nefer, the complex associated with Princess Shared Nepti and Nefer, and eventually the mastaba of Shepseska which will be the first to comment it on. Um, so here you can see most of the cemetery. Uh, north is to the right. So this is the mastaba that probably started the whole uh, cemetery's history, AS39, belonging to Shepseskafanch, uh, which is this blank space, and then the, all these mastabas together form a family, professionally linked um, cemetery with a, unif with, a, with a single entrance along the eastern facade of the mastaba of Neferinpu. Um, Shepseskafanch's tomb was access accessible from the north, coming up from the lake of Abusir. Uh, particularly well-preserved structures, you can see, uh, with walls reaching a height to a uh, um, height of about four to five meters, completely preserved, so no restoration over here. This is a Serdab, um, situated immediately behind the entrance into a corridor. There were actually two corridor chapels. The first one, the outer one, associated with minor members of the family, and the second one inside, leading directly to the offering, uh, offering niche, offering chapel with the false door of Shepseskafanch. Um, again, here you can see how remarkably well architecture um, is present in this part of the cemetery. Um, the false door uh, is basically nothing particular. It's not very impressive, yet it still stands to a height of about four meters and preserves all all titles um, associated with this chief um, chief physician of Upper and Lower Egypt, chief physician to the king and his family. Um, very important was to observe that uh, the false door was left uh, by the artist or artist unfinished. Uh, Shepseskafan apparently decided to pass away unexpectedly and nobody was willing to pay for the remaining amount of work. So some of the uh, some of the signs are still executed only in black paint, while others um, on the outer sides of the false door uh, were executed in a low older, low relief. Um, and as I said, you can quite observe quite well different stages in the false door production. On the spot, of course, first a preliminary drawings by the by the red color, improved by a master craftsman in black and then execute it in a, in a low relief. Um, and as I said, only part of the inscriptions was executed in a low relief. Um, name of, of the, of the Mastaba, Mastaba's owner, um, some of his titles, um, some of them are easy. He was a priest, he was officiating in the sun temples 
And he was also associated with the House of Life. It was a kind, if I simplify it, kind of scriptorium. He was priest of the magic, priest of Hnum, and also um, associate, he was a show, so associated with the House of Protection. And now we have a reason to believe that this facility, which was called House of Protection, Perza, um, was a facility where royal children were born. Um, that's, it makes also a perfect sense with his other, um, with his other titles, is particularly of chief physician and overseer of physicians, etc. Um, uh, physicians were also um, associated, as we know, in ancient Egypt with um, um, slaughtering activities. So one of the physicians uh, from the Mastaba of Tahotep II over here. Um, to our big surprise, when we open up a trench uh, in the area of the entrance into the into the complex, which is here, here is the western wall of Shepseskaf and Khmastaba, we discovered this rather shabby structure made of mud brick preserved to a height of about 20, 30 centimeters, floor of which was literally littered by hundreds of shirts intentionally broken by pebble hammers. We have about 20, 25 pebble hammers uh, in situ documented. And what we think that this, we think that this was probably a one, um, one event uh, facility that we know uh, from Abydos for the royal uh, complexes of the first, second dynasty that were built just for the burial ceremony and then um, dismantled on purpose. And this is probably a kind of a similar facility that was used during the burial ceremony, perhaps of Neferin Pu. Um, and then all the shirts from the festivi festivities were left behind on the floor and broken intentionally by, by hammers that were found in the, in the primary layer context together with the shirts. So this, uh, to my knowledge, the, uh, the only building from this period, I mean, by saying this period, I mean third millennium period. Um, and very nice example of the ritual of breaking thread shirts. Um, similar similar uh, probably activity like this one taking part in front of a typical old kingdom mastaba, mastaba's entrance. And we have to know that after, after this um, ritual, uh, the shirts had to be um, um, this discharge from the life, from the systemic context. Um, another well-preserved mastaba belonging probably to a member of the family was uh, the one belonging to Nef Wesser Nefer. Again, quite nicely preserved uh, with a corridor, with an open court for family gatherings, with a, a purification basin preserving um, uh, very nice botanical remains, including a papyrus flower. Our paleo botanist was quite excited about that. So this is the purification basin. Um, and the mastaba, again, nothing particularly impressive, a long corridor along the eastern facade, and completely destroyed offering chapel in the southeast corner. Um, another story um, comes from the um, subterranean uh, parts uh, with a um, um, stone-lined um, stone -lined chamber with many graffiti providing the name and some of the titles of the deceased person. Uh, canopic jars that were never used for mummification, I will get to it later. Um, and a statue. Um, going back to Juncker time, uh, there was a hypothesis that some statues were, uh, were displayed um, in burial chambers on purpose. This was a, a hypothesis um, heavily, uh, heavily opposed in the, in the decades to come. Nevertheless, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, quite ample evidence for several examples of old kingdom statuary being found in primary context in the burial chambers. And together with my colleague Hanna Vybazalova, we will talk about this issue next week in, in Poland. And also, we strongly believe that this is the primary context of, for these statues. Um, here's one of them to the south of the, um, of the sarcophagus. Um, this is now coming to uh, the most important or most, most uh, questionable um, entity in the whole cemetery, the, the so-called um, AS31, uh, AS the, the solar mastaba. Um, it took us several seasons to excavate the very deep deposits of sand. 
just for your uh, for your idea, from the topmost level down to the floor of AS31, it's more than eight or nine meters. We started this project in, uh, in around 2002. Um, this is uh, this is the entrance. One particular feature is the entrance itself uh, taking shape of a typical Old Kingdom false door featuring a lintel, horizontal lintel over here, and even a central slab slab stila here. I'm not sure if you can see it properly, but it's there, you have to believe me. And a cord in front of it, um, and inside a very nice, nicely um, um, executed um, rock cut chapel, actually the by far the largest rock cut chapel we have, uh, um, we have from Abu Sir and Saqqara area. Um, there's a cult chapel completely destroyed by the robbers. Um, I talk already about the orientation, 31 degrees uh, to the southeast from east. And titles again in featuring Per Anch and Per Za over here that link the owner of this Mastaba, whose name we are unfortunately don't have, uh, with Shepseska Fang. These are the only two quite unique persons that have feature these quite unique, uh, quite unique titles. The lintel from the false door, part of the title, title associated, associating the owner with the god Gnum. And uh, from the area to the north of the Mastaba, these two um, ram-shaped heads featuring even remains of ropes at the back uh, that were used to fasten the horns that we also found next to them. So it's quite, a, a, it's another crazy thing because this leads you to, to necessarily to suppose that there was a cultic facility for Hnum um, somewhere in the area of the cemetery. And we have every reason built to believe that it was a particularly interesting um, facility because we have several people associated with the god Hnum. Um, now it's, um, it's, uh, um, general view of the of the cemetery um, looking at it from the, uh, from the uh, from the north this mastaba of Neferinpu over here and this is our uh, season late 2010 I guess when we came across two pillars um, that later on turned into a complex belonging to a princess Sherat Nepti and high official uh, Nefer there are actually four Roka tombs one of them including the pillars and the court belongs to the princess Sherid Nepti. Uh, she was a daughter of New Sarah, as uh, my colleagues uh, Hanna Vimazalova uh, and Veronika Dulikova were able to show during the co course of the work. Um, the small courtyard over here accessible by a flight of steps from the north, and here in the south, south facade uh, altogether four rock-cut chapels were cut um, in the bedrock. Um, here you can see the uh, well-preserved pillars in the court featuring some secondary burials all around. Um, detail of, of the Princess Shirt Nepti here um, and the inscriptions on one of the, on one of the pillars um, all orientated um, southwards in direction of individual rock-cut tombs. Um, just a um, situation photograph showing the progress of the work discovery of a corridor with uh, altogether four and our statues uh, decorating the south facade of the uh, of the complex and um, works on the transportation of the first house um, to the to the magazines here general plan um, of the courtyard accessible from the north here and four altogether four master bus um, in the next 10 minutes I shall focus on these two is as 68 C belonging to shared Nepti and her family, and 68D belonging to Nefer and his family. A typical entrance, um, one of the entrances uh, starting in the courtyard. You can see that it was a quite um, sweating work to get it excavated in several subsequent uh, seasons. Uh, sometimes we were lucky that we came across, um, came across inscriptional evidence providing some details or data on the um, on the titles and names of respective owners, and a typical view of a rock cut um, chapel gallery uh, with um, shafts um, in the floor of the corridor, casing to large extent stripped off, and some graffiti. Um, details of the corridor um, 
there's uh, now a statues in the south in the south wall um, and we, as I indicated we will talk uh, in detail about the statue in Sardabs etc in um, in Warsaw next week so this will be an opportunity to venerate Karol Mishlevitz again um, AS 68C um, most of the rock cut chapels were heavily heavily robbed in antiquity probably still during the late 6th uh, dynasty first intermediate period originally they featured several false doors set up along the western wall of the of the chapel uh, always associated with a shaft leading to burial chamber uh, to the east of them uh, discovery of uh, fragments uh, originating from the false door of Shertnepti reconstruction um, uh, one of particular, one very important features were set up installations found both in 68C and 68D. Actually, in our in our view, this is by far the largest collection, complete collection of Old Kingdom statuary discovered on the pyramid fields over decades. Um, so this is uh, one of the one of the groups from AS 68C from the set up going to the Princess Shertnepti finding spot. Um, collection of the statues shortly after the discovery before they were taken to the uh, to the uh, restoration uh, restoration facilities of the of the uh, Sakara magazines um, one of the statues the only one from AS 68C featuring a name the statue very small one belonged to to Emira guess um, ED so this the except next to a shirt Nepti is the only known male person from AS 68C, which is from the Rocka Chapel of Sheridnepti. Uh, here you have seen the complete uh, complete set of statues from her set up. And from 68D, we were slightly more fortunate in terms of finds. Um, in one case, um, we found a false door still in situ, belonging to an official nefer, again, featuring, uh, featuring most important titles. And again, we could associate this this guy um, with the central administration and also with um, some temples in Abu Ghraib. So many, many male uh, members of the family were quite active, both on the pyramid fields and in the in the um, sun temples of the respective fifth dynasty kings. And now we haven't repainted the false door. This is how it was found in, uh, and dating back to 2000, say, say 2000, uh, 2300 uh, BC. And again, the rest of the remaining false doors um, missing. We still have um, one shaft to go, so maybe we will be fortunate and find some fragments inside. Um, and details, um, this is the, to, um, to honor our um, today's uh, birth section uh, speakers. And details of Nefer and his wife Nefer Hathor um, embracing him. And again, in AS 68D, we came across um, we came across Serdab, uh, full of statues. We found three of them on one day. The fourth one was found. This one was found even deeper one day later because the Serdab was quite uh, quite deep. Um, so we have a um, double statue featuring um, Nefer and his wife two striding statues and a scribe statue. Um, uh, because it's very unique corpus, we managed to uh, approach, to, in my view at least, uh, the best European scholars dealing with Old Kingdom statue and statue in general. Gabi Peek and Regina Schulz, who just jumped from the museum excited and they joined the team um, t one, one, one year ago. Um, so they work on a on a specific publication dedicated only to this huge corpus. Um, according to Gabi Pika, for instance, this scribe is one of the three third millennium scribes of this quality. There are only three of them. One is in the Louvre, another one is in, in the Cairo Museum, and this is the third one. Um, with a name, Nefer, with a papyrus scroll, with offering formulas and offering items, and even with dirty feet, um, so one day when I had nothing to do, I asked our tea, um, tea maker and Bobby to show me his feet. And you can compare the black painting on the feet. And so this is actually, again, an uh, idea of one of our um, German colleagues. That this is not a dirt uh, left behind by the careless uh, 
restorator, but it's really painted, and this is what you get when you walk uh, barefooted. Uh, this is um, from um, uh, from uh, from this year, uh, a burial chamber, a burial chamber of Nefer. Um, this is the guy with the beautifully painted false door. Um, robbed um, the top of it. The bedrock was very bad, about to collapse when we started to breach into the burial chamber. Uh, so we had only a couple of hours to take some preliminary photographs, measurements, um, photograph it um, very, very quickly, remove some model stone vessels, some bones inside and be left because as you can see, the ceiling is just leaning against the sarcophagus slit. And um, when we came the day after the discovery, the, the ceiling started to collapse. So we decided not to work inside and left, uh, left behind. AS-60, um, uh, the uh, shaft uh, four uh, featured a um, intact uh, sarcophagus. Um, with a uh, with, uh, kind of big jar still on the lid, um, sealed. Um, as the British say, there was much to do about nothing in it because there were high expectations under a burial chamber from the pyramids age. Uh, the outcome was <coughs> just a, um, uh, well, I say just um, intact uh, body of the owner. Again, we have no name. It was a male owner between 50 and 60 years with some minor uh, minor burial art items found inside. Um, eventually, uh, the last guy who joined the crowd of the family was uh, Nefer Inpu, whose mastaba we excavated in 2006 and 2007. And this is the mastaba to the north of which there is this shabby uh, mud brick structure with broken red pottery and pebbles, etc. Um, corridor mastaba, quite typical entrance from the east. Uh, place for two, four false doors, one of them, part of it found in situ, uh, complemented by two more fragments found in the shafts to the west of it. Uh, another false door completely missing nowadays, uh, we think, um, on display in the Manchester Museum. So it will be added um, into the publication which is due uh, this year. Um, this is the false door after reconstruction. Um, and just a slight reminder, uh, one of the very, uh, very important uh, issues connected with our South Abu Sir guys is that most of them can be easily identified in the archives uh, from Abu Sir. The story started in 1991 when we started the South Abu Sir project um, with Fetekti and Rahotep, and now we have maybe m more than 10 people actually working um, working um, working in the in the pyramid uh, in the pyramid complexes of the fifth dynasty kings and attested archaeologically from South Abu Sir um, mastabas in most cases um, they are owners of these individual mastabas some of them are high officials some of them are um, lower ranking uh, officials so to say and but the database is quite nice um, Neferin Pusa burial chamber was found intact um, it's a post new Sera time, most likely Jetkara, because of the two uh, seals that originally um, were found on the box with canopic chars. So this is the entrance. Um, when, when we removed the blocking wall, uh, we peeped inside and we saw beautiful things, as you can imagine. But unfortunately, this is not new kingdom, so it's just old kingdom. But still, 10 uh, beer jars found inside, a chunk of um, burnt, uh, burnt wood, at the entrance that gives us a very nice C14 date to the north, to the south, because this is view from the west. Um, you can see sealed sarcophagus, and over here, a completely decayed sarcoph um, uh, canopic chest that uh, contained four canopic jars, uh, found completely empty. Uh, this is another story developed originally by uh, by my friend Toja Jeuska. For this uh, moment, it's, it must uh, suffice to say that uh, there, are, there is very rich evidence showing that uh, canopic jars were in, during the third millennium BC, as far as the non-royal context is concerned, never used for mummification. These are dummy, dummy vessels. That's all. Um, and inside the sarcophagus, um, Nefer, li um, Nefer Inpu lying inside. Um, 
we could see that uh, the uh, the people that were arranging for his bur burial didn't take uh, proper measurements. So when they were um, providing for the sarcophagus, uh, they brought in um, and lowered down a slightly um, smaller um, smaller thing than expected. And when they were putting him inside, they had to um, bend, uh, break slightly his legs. So, um, but still, they managed to fit him in. Um, so this is the uh, this is the res uh, reconstruction for the National Geographic report 2000, back in in 2008. Um, again, you can see that he featured several uh, personal belongings, including a headrest. Again, a lousy quality, um, made of wood. And when they um, when they assembled the, th the thing together, which consists obviously of three parts of the of the um, of the foot. Um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the feet and the act up part, they found out that it's not uh, holding um, together uh, properly, so they had to provide for two, um, two small wooden um, discs that would fix uh, the, the headrest together. Um, a walking stick, a herab scepter over here, etc., etc. As you can see, no mummification, just a plastered body. There is a one quite detailed study by Tuckerbeck from the 1990s um, summarizing the evidence for these uh, plastered bodies. Examples of, um, of the finds from the, from the sarcophagus. Um, another mental game back in 2008, we started uh, with a long-term project of scanning individual artifacts and finds from Abu Sir. So this is a um, Restoration of the of the skull of uh, Neferin Pu that was um, scanned on the on the spot um, in Abu Sir, then in RPT, which is rapid prototyping um, oven, um, we created a model of the of the skull, and then uh, our anthropologist um, calculated the proportions um, of the um, of the physical. Um, appearance of the guy, and then we hired um, um, another guy who was able to finish the project. And this is the um, most likely, most likely appearance of Neferinpu, going back to 2300 BC. And uh, I asked uh, my colleague uh, Muhammad Megai, and he said yes, it could be a typical Saidi, Saidi man. <laughs> um, uh, this is. Uh, this is the end of this brief presentation, showing just the uh, multidisciplinary character of our work in Abu Sir. I talked already about beetles, um, hand ordering um, in the lake of Abu Sir that we did in 2007. Um, our anthropologists working on skeletal uh, remains. Um, restoration, uh, reconstruction that was uh, kindly provided by um, another big friend of our mission, Sandro Vanini. Um, that uh, basically reflects the fundamental changes that took place on the pyramid fields. Um, so this is restoration, uh, reconstruction of the pyramid fields as looking around 2400 BC, um, savanna-like um, landscape, and then 2200 BC, as you know, even the NATO organized back in 1996 or five a big conference about the collapse of civilizations in the Northern Hemisphere dating back to 2200 BC. One of the principal organizers was George Kukla, a famous Czech geologist uh, working in uh, the last 50 years in the States and quite important advisor to several American presidents on the climate change, and also to Václav Klaus. Um, so this is in, uh, in brief uh, what we, uh, what we um, have from Abu Sir from the last few years, of course, I had to be quite brutal in terms of in terms of details. But uh, since I promised a brief presentation of Shepses Kafan, I decided to present a broader context for this guy, um, showing his family, and uh, I could talk quite long about political implications, status, legitimacy, etc. But it's important just to take. Um, for the moment, take 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 uh, take note of the basic basic features that are connected with this with this work, and there are many issues that each each of them would be a topic for independent independent presentation for an hour. So thank you very much, and now you are definitely released.
Have a nice evening. <laughs>